Returning to Source, Class 5, Educational Wounding, Innate Intelligence, and Restorative Breathwork. Hello, I'm Jim Morningstar, your guide through this nine-class journey of Returning to Source, our innate intelligence and educational history. Now, in my counseling work since the late 1960s, I've encountered countless individuals who do not consider themselves smart, at least in terms of how they did in school. Further inquiry always reveals reasons for these conclusions, which are seldom a lack of gray matter. One of the questions I almost always ask is, what was going to school like for you originally? Well, kindergarten. Answers range from a traumatic separation from an identity-defining bonding that they had with a person in their family, most often mother, to a dramatic experience of freedom and fascinating new worlds opening to them. Now, the difference for many being how secure they were supported in feeling within themselves at home and the match they experienced in the school environment with the skills and learning style they had adopted. We all know that when we're severely emotionally challenged, our capacity for logical thinking is compromised. When our amygdala, or early warning smoke detector, as it's been called, is on red alert, the hypothalamus disengages connections to the prefrontal cortex, where we do our logical thinking and planning. And connections are directed to our emergency network, which helps us flight or flee danger. Should neither of these options be available, a third freeze response may be engaged to shut down all but the most primal vital functions to help preserve the organism. Neither of these two later conditions are conducive to new learning that's not connected to immediate survival. Children whose emotionality is deregulated have a hard time attending, concentrating, or remembering, or they may do so intermittently and have their overall standardized performance impaired. Hence, their belief that they're not intelligent. The good news is that our organism is highly resilient and our spirit can be undaunted. I've seen many traumatized individuals overcome their difficulties and live highly functional or even exemplary lives. In fact, some of the compensatory mechanisms developed for their survival, for example, a heightened sensitivity, survival instincts, empathy, psychic awarenesses, can become signature strengths which give them superior advantages when integrated into their healed personal and regulated professional lives. Types of intelligence. Having attended a graduate program whose chairperson literally wrote the textbook on an intelligence test construction, I became appreciative of what IQ tests measure, their limitations and their biases. Indeed, they are standardized on a cross-section of a population whose prevailing values are being measured. Individuals are then compared to the range of abilities of that population on a number of different tasks that are valued in that culture. The tasks in the most commonly used IQ test are divided into two categories, verbal and performance. The scores are all averaged, resulting in IQ, or intelligence quotient, which is then either understood and used properly to rate an individual on how they perform with how they may be expected to perform on individual tasks in the future, or explain difficulties with these tasks for them in the past. Ideally, it will help suit them to use their skills in the right settings and or improve areas they need to improve for a satisfying life. The most commonly used IQ test in the United States was developed by David Wexler in the 1930s. The latest revision, WACE 3, was released in 1997. It provides scores for verbal IQ, performance IQ, that is nonverbal, and the combination of these two, the full scale IQ. 
along with four secondary indices or subdivisions, verbal comprehension, working memory, perceptual organization, and processing speed. That score puts an individual in a range of the general population from the very superior to well below average. Unfortunately, the IQ score can be misused to stand for the overall value of a person or group of people and work to the detriment of all involved. That is, the individual's true talents are not discovered and worked with, and the society is deprived of the unique gifts that each person has to contribute, to say nothing of the damage it potentially does to an individual's self-esteem. When an IQ test standardized on the average American was given to a group of Navajos, they came out as a group below average. When an IQ test standardized on the Navajo culture was given to average Americans, as a group, they scored in the dull normal range. Even within the majority Western culture, it's been demonstrated that different types of intelligence can be measured, each one of them contributing significantly to the welfare of the whole. Howard Gardner proposed this model in his 1983 book, Frames of Mind, the theory of multiple intelligences. These include musical, rhythmic and harmonic, visual spatial, verbal linguistic, logical mathematical, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, existential. He also included, later on, moral intelligence and teaching pedagogical intelligence. Now, many of these forms of intelligence, however, are not recognized or supported in our traditional educational systems. Students who exhibit them are often marginalized, fall in the cracks, or worse, are shamed and punished or bullied for their differences. Again, I've personally counseled numerous individuals who as children or even as adults, had to hide their psychic sensitivities or paranormal awarenesses in order to be accepted, or if they did not, suffer the consequences of being targeted as weird or even evil. Take Handout 1, Educational Wounding and Intelligence, and complete Section 1, Attitudes Toward My Intelligence, Social Skills, Physical Abilities, and Work Ethic, I learned in primary or grade school are. Section two, in what ways did these attitudes shift in secondary school, high school, or beyond? Further education. For me, there was a great shift in the messages I received and the attitudes I adopted between my primary and secondary schooling. Section three, how do these attitudes influence my present life is? Leave section four blank for now. Now, if you can, turn off the video and complete these three sections, one, two, and three of handout one, and then come back to the video. Each month, we do an experiential exercise that highlights the level of conscious evolution we are examining within us. This month, it is the pragmatic level of existence. It's called pragmatic because the ideal of this level is to recognize dysfunctional patterns and replace them with one's that lead to more satisfying and repeatable results. The element of freedom to explore within reasonable limits and to achieve on one's own initiative is important. Again, we use these exercises to bring to consciousness what may be impeding our full potential and empowerment. Exercise number one. We will work now with the example of the attitudes toward yourself you learned in your early educational experiences as you described on Handout 1, Sections 1, 2, and 3. We're going to take you through a guided breathwork visualization around the situations in which these attitudes were developed. However, be open to whatever surfaces as you breathe. It could be just sensations, emotions, thoughts, and or other attitudes than the ones you wrote down. Suggest that whatever comes up is there for the benefit of your intended release or reinforcement. Now get yourself in a relaxed sitting or lying position in which you are warm and comfortably supported and are close enough to hear the video. 
Stop the video if you need to get situated, then come back. First, have the loving intention to go back to those experiences which led to the attitudes you wrote about on Handout 1, Sections 1 through 3, for the purpose of releasing whatever attitudes do not serve you and reinforcing those that do. Our purpose is restoring full aliveness and health to your body, mind, and spirit. We will again use a faster than normal form of breathing through the mouth and release on the exhale to initiate a somewhat heightened energy state and then do some active expression and movements in order to reprogram attitudes we choose to reprogram. You'll put your attention on your diaphragm and heart area and breathing through your mouth, take an active inhale, bringing the energy from your diaphragm to your heart then without pause, exhale from your heart to your diaphragm, not pushing or forcing it, and relaxing on the exhale. Keep the inhale and exhale connected without pause, but again, adjust your pace and volume to what allows you to be energized without overwhelming your system. It'll look something like this. We'll do a few minutes of this faster breathing and then do some visualization work. Let's begin. Keep the pace going and let yourself get adjusted to the faster than normal rhythm that you can easily sustain as I talk. If you need to switch to breathing through your nose, do this. That's okay. Now, continue your cycle of faster than normal breathing and bring your attention to an attitude toward yourself that no longer serves you, even if it's had a positive intent at its inception. As you breathe, let the situations and feelings come to mind in which this attitude was fostered, but see it from a loving witness point of view. Do not collapse into the scene and experience it from the inside. Notice the patterns of behavior that this attitude have led to as you progressed in your life? And which of these patterns presently limit you unfavorably? Again, from a loving observer position, as you continue to breathe fully, see yourself now entering your life and giving yourself the tools, the circumstances, and the encouragement to challenge and change the situations which led to the negative conclusions about yourself. It's important that you take your time and feel this intervention as loving and empowering. You will need the courage to face any opposition from outside or inside yourself to regroove these new neural pathways. It's important that you breathe and feel it. Now, if vocalizations and or movements help the process, give yourself permission to use them with gusto. This is your brain and your body and your life, and you must rewrite the scripts that no longer serve you. No one else can effectively do this for you, but you can use the support of all of us having the courage to join you in the process. Now, this is not trying to change the past, but challenging the present patterns you still carry in your brain and psyche. Breathe and feel the changes that envisioning new life patterns make for your sense of well-being. This is claiming your innate intelligence to control your own destiny, here and now. The more you can give yourself permission to breathe this into your body and feel it, the better. Even if you can only do this a little bit, it's a great victory and the skill will improve as you practice it. This skill is free and it's yours. Claim it. <laughs> okay. 
Now breathe easily and let it soak in for a moment. Some people will not fully experience the changes till hours or days later. All in good time. Now we're going to revisit this process with a positive attitude towards yourself that you choose to reinforce. So once again, put your body in a comfortable position and initiate a cycle of slightly faster than normal breathing. Now bringing your attention to an attitude toward yourself that serves you well, even if others had judgments or fear about it in the past. As you breathe, let the situations and feelings come to mind in which this attitude was fostered and see it from a loving witness point of view. Notice the patterns of behavior that this attitude have led to as you progressed in your life and which of these patterns you would like to see grow. Again, from the loving observer position, as you continue to breathe fully, see yourself entering your life and giving yourself the tools, circumstances, and encouragement to foster the growth of these attitudes and the results they produce. It's important that you take your time and feel this intervention as loving and empowering. You will need the courage to face any opposition from outside or inside yourself to regroove these new neural pathways to growth and empowerment. It's important that you breathe and feel it. If vocalizations and or movements help the process, give yourself permission to use them again with gusto. <laughs> again, this is your brain, your body, and your life and you have the power to rewrite the scripts that promote your highest good. No one else can effectively do this for you, but you can use the support of all of us having the courage to join you in the process. Breathe and feel the changes that envisioning new life patterns make for your sense of well-being. This is claiming your innate intelligence to control your own destiny here and now. The more you can give yourself permission to breathe this into your body and feel it, the better. Now, even if you can only do this a little bit, it's a great victory, and the skill will improve as you practice it. Again, it's free. It's yours. Claim it. Breathe easily and let it soak in for a moment. Some people will not fully experience the changes till hours or days go by. It's all in good time. Now, take handout one and complete section 4A, how I'm willing to change or reinforce these attitudes about myself is. And in section 4B, steps I will take to implement these changes are. So, turn off the video and come back when you've completed this and take time to integrate these changes if you need to. Holding you in my heart as fellow travelers on the road home, I send and receive blessings for our circle and all sentient beings till next class. Blessings in light and love. <laughs>